episode 75. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archi Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archi Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archi Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archiofficecom Today's guest is Ryan Hansanuat. Ryan is a licensed architect and the author of the book, A Beginner's Guide, How to Become an Architect. He was recently selected as a finalist for the Nationwide Business Plan Competition put on by Charette Venture Group. We had a chance to catch up in Chicago, and I'm glad to have him on the show today. Ryan, welcome back to the business of architecture. Thanks, Enid. Glad to be here. Good. It is great to have you. Now, tell us a little bit about your story, because last week we talked about the business plan competition, et cetera, but I want to get a yeah. little bit into you know, kind of how you got started in architecture, what took you out to Austin, because that's an interesting story. Yeah. So <laughs> it's funny. When I, I write this on my blog, is I... A lot of people say they knew they wanted to be an architect when they were five years old. I, I didn't. Um, I didn't realize till much later that I wanted to be an architect, but looking back, I probably should have realized it earlier. Uh, but I spent most of my time uh, doing accounting. My dad was an accountant. I was going to take over his business. Uh, my aunt was in real estate and business, and I spent my whole life doing business because that was kind of what I was supposed to do. Um, I don't like to talk about this a lot, but I, it might help some people. So I just want to say that you know, I, I was a high school dropout. Uh, I didn't finish high school. I did end up going back and getting my GED, but uh, it wasn't until much later in life that I realized I didn't really want to do accounting. Uh, <laughs> I wanted I wanted something more than just doing dealing with numbers all day. So for me, I took a, a introduction to architecture class at a, at a junior college, and it was that day that I realized, okay, well, this is what I was meant to do. Uh, so I started taking more uh, call it, uh, junior college classes in architecture and then eventually transferred on to get my bachelor's of architecture degree at, at Cal Poly Pomona. And I guess I was making up for lost time. I decided to go back and get a master's degree in building science as well. So, uh, you know, I spent a lot of years um, getting my degrees and doing everything in architecture after having spent many years doing something completely different. Uh, but looking back, you know, I, I drew floor plans when I was a kid. I played with Legos all the time. I, I built my treehouse myself. So I kind of knew I always wanted to be an architect. Has it lived up to your expectations of what you thought it was going to be like? It has. In, in some ways it has, in some ways it hasn't. Um, I, I didn't realize when I was going through school how little design I would get to do. You know, it's some, that's kind of a harsh realization a lot of people come to is, is I went to school to design. I really want to design. And it's not to say I'd never do it. But it's, it's such a small portion of what being an architect is really like. But at the same note, that's what I really enjoy about it is there's so many different things you can do. And, and you know, what I always like to say on my blog, too, is that if, you, if you're into architecture, there's so many different avenues you can go in. Uh, if, if you don't want to design all day, you don't have to. If you want to design all day, you could probably find a job doing that as well. Uh, there's so many different things you could do as an architect. And that's what I really love about it, that it, it's different from what I thought it would be, but I still love it either way. Yeah, and Ryan, you're mentioning your blog. Tell us what blog that is so people can go there. Yeah, sorry. It's uh, architecturecareerguide.com. And the, the intention of that, I started that because uh, when I first uh, kind of got into a management position, I got a few interns, and I, I realized I was spending so much time explaining to, things to them and, and trying to give them life lessons, if you will, that they said, you know, you should probably you should, you should write a book. So I didn't do that. I started a blog, 
and then I decided, you know what, I might as well write a book too. So I actually have a couple books that you can find through the website as well. And the whole point of that is to kind of give people the information that I didn't necessarily have and a lot of people didn't have when we first started in architecture of what it's really like. What do you think are the, some of the key things that people don't know about or that they, they didn't understand? Well, you know, first off, the design is a big one. But you need to know a lot of different things to be an architect. Uh, it's not just about uh, design, but it's also about politics, uh, how to deal with people, how to deal with contractors, uh, how, to, how to give presentations, um, technology, obviously, using uh, the computers, using software, um, how, to, how to market, how to meet people, how to run a business. 90% um, of my day is not doing what people would probably consider architecture. It's, it, I spend more time on the phone or with email than I do at the drafting board. Well, actually, I don't know. People don't use drafting boards anymore, but I do. But <laughs> we we get on, the point. Yeah. <laughs> so what took you out to Austin? Because originally you were in Southern California, correct? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in Southern California, and you know, this was when I moved out was during the recession. So times were getting bad; jobs were, were hard to find. Um, but it was it was also at a perfect time. I had just gotten licensed, um, and and I was uh, my hours were cut at my last firm, and so I had two young kids that uh, they weren't in school yet. So we figured if we're going to make a move, let's let's do it now. And I was able to get out to Austin, get a job out there, out here, uh, thanks to the fact that I had a license and years of experience as well. But it, it's, it's weird because uh, moving to a new city, all the connections you made are gone, and you kind of have to start over again. And that's, that's, that was a hard part for me is, you know, all my clients that I had dealt with in California, I couldn't lean on them for more work anymore. I had to find new clients out here. So it, it actually helped me grow quite a bit to, to be able to start over in, in a new area. And is this the firm you're currently working for right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so currently the, the firm I'm working for now is we're, we're a small firm. We do uh, mostly commercial work. Um, and it's funny because I, I, I started as a drafter at this firm because it was the recession, times were hard. I had to take whatever job I can get. Uh, so I started as a drafter, and then uh, a couple years later I was vice president of the firm. So I yeah, was able to move up pretty quickly there. But, uh, you know, when times are hard, you got to take whatever job you can get. So tell us about what, what's your advice for moving up the career ladder so quickly? Yeah. Um, for me, it was, I was lucky because I actually had uh, quite a few years of experience before um, I got my license. Uh, I was working full-time while I was in school. Um, so I actually finished IDP before I finished school, started taking my test, and got my license before I finished grad school. So... Uh, for me, that you know, I was kind of double double duty for a little while there, uh, but I was able to get a lot of experience really quick. But uh, once I had that experience, I had that license, I was able to take it to the firm that I that I was at and say, I really would like to have more responsibility. And I wasn't I wasn't shying away from anything they asked me to do. Uh, if I was if I was just a designer and they asked me to go manage the project, I, I would do it and and chalk it up to a learning experience. Um, and and the trick is to to understand your limits, um, go out and, and if they ask you to go to a job site, go do it. But if you're not comfortable doing it, make sure you're, you're comfortable with it. But get, get out there and, and take the responsibilities as they come. And if they don't come, ask for a little bit more responsibility. My first job when I was out there, when I was at this firm as a drafter, um, I actually started managing the project. And it was from that that I could prove that I knew what I was doing. Uh, so I eventually became a project manager. Um, I had a great opportunity when I was in California, and, and this was when I was still in school. Uh, I, was, I was just a drafter for the, for the firm, but uh, we had a project that was going after a lead accreditation, and I had a uh, lead certification. I had my lead accreditation at the time. Um, I knew, I knew the, the, the point system back and forth, so I, I basically said, let me take on this responsibility. Let me take on this role of doing all the paperwork, everything necessary for it. And because of my efforts, we were able to get lead gold on the project, but it also showed my bosses that I was able to take responsibility and run with a project that they, that they weren't able to do, and I was able to prove my value. Um, I'm going to use that word a lot because it keeps coming back, is if you want to move up, you have to show value to the company, more than just somebody that they could find to draft for you, somebody that they could design. But what are you doing to bring value to the company? Uh, had I not taken that lead project on, we may not have gotten lead gold, and that's a big deal. It was a big deal for the company. So I was able to show them that uh, by by my abilities, I'm able to add value to the firm. 
Excellent. Yeah, I've seen that that's a key. I know there's a lot of people who are anxious. They want to move ahead, but they don't want to take on the responsibility or they maybe want to raise, but then they, um, yeah. you know, like you said, you got to bring in the work and, and put yourself yeah. out there. You know, I, I, any, any opportunity that came to my door, whether it was my job title, my description or not, I did it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and even if I didn't get paid for it, because my, my thought was, you know, that I'm going to learn something at the, at a minimum. I may not get paid in dollar value, but I'm going to get paid in knowledge, which can help me later. So in your specific situation then, Ryan, with that kind of mindset, how did you go from being a project manager at the time to having the position of uh, vice president at the company you're with? Yeah, that, that's, that's a bigger jump because what you need to do is, again, when you're providing value uh, as a project manager is one thing, but to provide value as a partner, uh, you need to start bringing in work. And that's, that's the key there is finding your own clients. Uh, so, so the way I was able to do that is, um, obviously I was doing really well managing my projects and all my projects were going fine, but I took it upon myself to go out there and to the, get into the community and get to know people and show that I'm entrenched in a certain area. I have certain clients that I'm bringing with me. A lot of times people may even move firms and bring their clients with them. Anything you could do to bring projects into the firm that shows you're more than just somebody who's managing the projects, but you're actually invested in the firm itself. Um, so w what I did is, is I went out and found some clients. <laughs> it sounds real easy, right? I just went and found some clients. But yeah, right. uh, uh, the, the way I did that is I just, you know, again, I was in a new area. So this, this was a little hard for me to get to know everybody. But uh, one thing I'd recommend for anybody out there that's looking to get out there and kind of make connections in the community, uh, if you have it, if, if your town has it, is a leadership program. Uh, I was pretty lucky to go through. Uh, in, in my hometown of Cedar Park, where I actually live, is uh, they had a, a leadership program held by the Chamber of Commerce. And so you pay, I think it was a couple hundred bucks, you get to this leadership program, but you get to meet uh, the mayor, the council members, uh, city managers, so you got the city people. But then you start meeting the bankers, you start meeting the lawyers, you start meeting the accountants, and you start making real friendships. Uh, that's kind of where it starts is get to know who the people are and get them get them to be friends with you. I mean, it, you, I still talk to a lot of people in my leadership class and we're still friends, but through them, they knew somebody that needed, a, needed work. They needed a, an architect. Uh, they put me in touch with them and I'm able to bring this client into my firm now and say, look, through the things I have done, I'm now helping the firm get more money, get more clients. And I'm actively involved in, in getting, getting more, more money for the firm. Uh, and it just kind of slowly progressed from there to where I wasn't managing as many projects as I was bringing in the clients. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. Archie Office has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. Now back to our show. So that, that first project you brought in, uh, mm -hmm. can you tell me about that, how that happened? Yeah, so this one was, uh, it was again through the leadership program. I had met somebody. Uh, she was a, a, a banker in, in the area, and she had a client. In, and again, it was a small project, but you know they wanted a, a, uh, it's a it, they worked for a nonprofit, and they wanted a pavilion. Uh, just a shade structure coming in. Uh, they wanted it, you know, pretty high design from, from what used, they're used to doing in the area. So they just put me in contact with them. And, and I was able to sit down with them and just kind of get some ideas out and sketches. And I did this all on my own time, uh, you know, on the weekends, whenever I had time. And at, when the time came for them to move forward, I said, hey, you know, yeah, you're really going to need an architect on this. Make sure you come by my office and, we'll, and we can talk about it some more. And so they came in and, you know, I had my boss come in and I said, hey, this is, uh, you know, so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, they want this one project, and uh, that project ended up turning into uh, more buildings for their for their uh, nonprofit, uh, which tied into a local YMCA that we were doing. Uh, so it kind of escalated from there, but it all started from that one little project that I was just willing to take my time to go talk to the guy about doing, and next thing you know, it's, it's turned into bigger projects. Awesome. So uh, to date, what would you say has been your biggest win in, uh, in business development? Uh. Is there something that jumps out? No, I mean, we've, we've had quite a few. One that actually, um, I'd say biggest win for me, I don't know from a monetary standpoint, but just from a, from a pride standpoint, is it was this local uh, rental facility that we just finished. Uh, it was owned by a, a, a pretty big name in the, in the city, 
and she had donated it to, to the city to rent it out for weddings. Um, that place ended up getting flooded and getting torn down. So uh, we were able to, I was able to get our firm in there to, to design the new facility for them. Um, so we were able to complete the project. I think it was like two, two $3 million project, um, which for us is about normal size. But for me, the greatest thing was we had a grand opening just a couple weeks ago. And that's why it sticks in my mind is we did the ribbon cutting and, and, and the former owner said, you know, this, this made my day. I never thought we'd have something as nice as we did. As, as we could have and, and all the community members were just you know so glad to have have the design that they did um gr you know mon money wise it probably didn't bring too much into the firm but from from a pride standpoint and from being connected to the community it made a big difference for us awesome ryan if you had the opportunity to sit down with someone who's just starting out in architecture school mm -hmm. what would be the main you know two or three points that you would that you would want to let them know to help them be successful so yeah, if they're just starting an architecture school, obviously, you know, you're going to be taking a lot of time in design classes. You're going to be spending a lot of time with your your fellow architecture students. But the biggest thing you could probably do is to get out of studio. Go take business courses. Go take you know any other courses that you can, and get to know people outside of studio. Because the people, the friends you make in studio, they're going to be probably your friends for life, anyways. But the people you meet that aren't in the architecture program, they're going to be your future clients. They're going to be the people that you turn to later on that have jobs that are going to be looking for you. You're not going to get any jobs from, from a career standpoint. You're not going to get any jobs from, from fellow architecture students. You're going to get it from the people who aren't in your studio with you. But at the same time, just enjoy a studio because <laughs> when you're going through architecture school, we all, we all kind of know anybody who's done it, it, it it's, it's almost like hell sometimes. But once you're out of it for many years, sometimes you wish you were back there, as crazy as it sounds. Um, sometimes I wish I was just free with uh, you know, no restrictions to just design free and just do whatever I want. So uh, first off, you know, get out of studio, but at the same time when you're there, really enjoy it. Awesome. Any, any other advice, Ryan, that you have for just in terms of the business of architecture in general? Yeah. you know. It, it, it all depends on, on, on your personality. So for, first, you got to kind of find out what type of person you are. But um, for me, it was all about learning fast and quick and doing everything I can to get the information as quickly as I can. So uh, for me, it was a matter of, you know, not just going through school, but going to think, places like Business of Architecture and listening to the podcast. Um, any, anything from uh, any books you can read, anything you can get out there to get more information. Uh, I'd rather... I'd rather know something for the future and not be able to do it and, and not rather than being stuck in a situation and not knowing what the hell's going on. I've had many situations when I was, uh, when I was still kind of coming up in the career that uh, I got way above my head, but I was able to fall back on the things that I learned through a book, uh, you know, to at least fumble my way through it, I guess. But, uh, you know, you just got to get out there and, and learn as much as you can and not be afraid to take chances. Do you have any any of your favorite business books that you can recommend to us that have influenced you personally? Yeah, uh, well, I love E Myth Revisited. If, if anybody you're familiar with that, uh, it's a great one. First, you know, it talks about setting up standards, how to how to set a business. It's not specifically for architecture, um, but but it's one that I think anybody should read. Um, Good to Great is, is another great book as well, um, and I like everything from from Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Outliers. That's also a good one. None of these are really specific to architecture, but they do in some way relate to architecture. And if you read it with that mindset, you can kind of spin it around and understand how, how it could, how it could uh, relate. Excellent. All right, so I'll put links to those in the show notes. And, yeah. you know, are, are there, is there anything else that you want to, that you, you know, that we left out, Ryan, that you think we need to talk about? About you know we're talking about kind of career development right now, or yeah. thoughts about people who are looking to advance their careers in architecture. Yeah, a couple of things. You know, there's a lot about IDP, uh, a lot about the ARE. Um, the thing is, is I don't want to say none of it matters, but uh, you'll get through it. Uh, you know, when when you're doing IDP, uh, you have a lot of hours that you need to get. Just be proactive about it. Uh, don't stress so much when you're not getting certain hours in certain areas that you know you're not going to get it done on time. Just sit and talk to your supervisor, talk to your boss. If they're any good, they'll they'll understand um, and be proactive about it. Because for me personally, when I have an intern, I'm always you know I'll sit down every month with with them and kind of go through. But not every boss is like that. Uh, so you kind of have to take the bull by the horns and say, 
look, here's what I need to do to finish IDP. I'm, I'm short in these areas. Is there anything we could do to, to understand these areas? Uh, so, so with IDP, you need to be proactive about your own growth and your own, your own learning. Uh, and then with the AREs, it's kind of hard because they're changing every couple of years, but you know, people stress about what order to take the tests in, uh, what study material they need to get. You know, the first step is just scheduling a test. The second step is learning about the test. The hardest thing is that first step is just scheduling it. You know, yeah. it, it seems so hard, but you know, you really can get through it. You just got to have a positive attitude all the way through. And then once you get that, you get your license and, and everything's awesome. You're great. You're, you're a registered architect. And then, and then the real education begins on how to actually practice as an architect. Yeah, no kidding. Well, Ryan, how, how do people get a hold of you and find out more about, you know, your books and what you're up to? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm easily accessible through uh, Architecture Career Guide. Uh, you can drop me a note there. Um, it also has links to the, to the books that I've, I've written for that. Um, I also have the Architecture Business Plan website as well that we mentioned in the last episode. Um, so yeah, just, just get me through that or, or on Twitter. I'm on Twitter quite a bit on, uh, as Arc Career Guide, at Arc Career, Gu Career Guide, or Facebook, just about anywhere. And, and definitely shoot me a note. Anybody who's interested, has questions, you know, put a comment on my page, send me an email. I'm glad to help out. All right, Ryan. Well, I remember we touched bases and we scheduled this back at the AIE convention. We were sitting there in one of the rooms in the the, uh, the hotel designed by Daniel Burnham right there in downtown Chicago. Yep. The Reliance, yeah. Yep, the Reliance. And I'm glad that we had this opportunity to make it happen. Yeah, it was great. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay, Ryan, take care. All right, bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.